to start us off. My name is Claire Ladd and I am the Programs and Services Manager at the Massachusetts Nonprofit Network. And thank you for joining us today. Just those few items before we dig in. The recording and the slides from today's program will be emailed to you afterwards. So please keep an eye out for that. You can submit questions to us via the Q&A function and you can use the chat to let us know if you have any technical difficulties and we can assist with that at any time. I also want to give a little background about us here at MNN. Our three goals are to strengthen the nonprofit sector through advocacy, public awareness, and capacity building services. This webinar as part of a web webinar series is part of our capacity building offerings and we offer regular webinars so please stay tuned for future topics and reach out to us if you have any topics you'd like to see. And our efforts are made possible by our more than 600 member organizations. To those who are members, thank you so much for your partnership. And if you have not yet joined the network, but you want to learn more about the opportunities you can take advantage of through membership, such as networking, trainings, and cost savings, please visit massnonprofitnet.org join to find out more. All right, today's webinar, Save the Day, Data Visualization to the Rescue, is presented by Edwin Harvey and William Schwab from your part-time controller. Now I'll hand it over to the presenters to get started. All right, thank you, Claire, and uh, good afternoon, everyone, and hello and welcome uh, to today's webinar. Um, Edwin and I are so excited to be presenting this topic today, uh, Save the Day, Data Visualization uh, to the Rescue. So before we get started, uh, again, just to follow up uh, what Claire mentioned, just a, just a few quick housekeeping items. So again, please remember that you can see and hear us, but we cannot see and hear you, so please use um, the chat function and the Q&A function to post questions throughout today's uh, presentation. We'll be monitoring these questions as they come in and we'll do our best to answer them during the presentation. Uh, time permitting, we may also have time for additional Q&A at the end of the session. And of course, uh, all of the slides uh, will be made available uh, to you as well following today's presentation. So you can revisit anything that you might have missed or would like to review again. Uh, so with that, uh, let me just uh, move quickly uh, to introduce myself uh, and, uh, and my co-presenter. Uh, my name is William Schwab and uh, I lead uh, your part-time controllers national data visualization practice. And I am based out of YPTC's Philadelphia office in Pennsylvania and certainly very excited uh, to be uh, here with you today. And I'm thrilled as well to be joined today by my colleague Edwin Harvey who is uh, also a manager in our data visualization practice as well. So just a little bit about your part-time controller or YPTC for short. We are a professional services firm specializing in nonprofit financial management uh, for 30 years. This year actually marks uh, our 30th anniversary. Our goal is to help our clients sleep at night by providing services that include day-to-day -day accounting, financial reporting, best practices, and of course, data visualization, just to name a few. We have over 1,500 active clients, and that's the latest number. You'll see it says 1,400 on the slides, uh, in more than 40 states across the US, as well as clients in several other countries. And while we have eight regional offices, like in Boston, and are continuing to grow, we are proud to be able to serve our clients all over the country with our YPTC Anywhere offering, helping clients remotely wherever they are located. Here are today's learning objectives. Now, if you look really closely, uh, you might notice that the superhero graphic that was on the title slide um, is here on this slide as well, but it's in black and white and it's in the background and it's, it's kind of faded out. And this is intentional um, and Edwin will explain why uh, a little bit later. However, our main goal today is to explain how graphics can be used to tell important financial and non-financial stories about your organization. So to accomplish this, we wanna help you recognize three core concepts for delivering information through data visualization. Distinguish between static and dynamic graphic types and when to use each. Identify the essential elements of a storytelling static graphic. Identify data visualization design stories through four case studies. And finally, recognize graphic placement tips for storytelling success. 
We hope this will give you a lot of great ideas and make your data accessible to individuals of many backgrounds. I'm especially excited about the case studies that Edwin, Edwin will be presenting a little bit later. I hope you find today's topic interesting and exciting. So let's dive in. Whether you're an accounting professional, an executive director, a board member, or maybe part of a development or program team, a big part of your job is communicating the essential information that you've worked hard to gather and create. Your audience, whether they're funders or grant recipients, board members, internal staff, your target population, or even the general public, whoever they are, they need to know what you're observing, what you're discovering, and what you're recommending about your organization. But they may not be well prepared to receive the information you're trying to deliver, especially if it's financial or otherwise quantitative information. Some people just don't like numbers. Some are more experienced in mission delivery or fundraising than in balance sheets and operational efficiencies, and everyone is short on time. So they need all the help they can get to understand what you have to say, because you are saying some very important things. You want to make it easy for them and package information in such a way that your audience can easily engage and understand it. And this goes beyond just charts and graphs. Visualizing data is really just a special case of the general idea of presenting information clearly in ways that are easy to understand. So if you're not already using graphics to help tell your story, perhaps you're wondering if they're ever really needed and if your audience would actually value them. Well, YPTC's experience has been that while some folks may not be familiar with the term data visualization or infographics, most people do intuitively understand the value of data visualization. You may have heard your clients or staff or board members say things like what's listed on this slide. These are pleas for help that visualizations can deliver. And maybe you've even asked one of these questions. For, an, for example, a CFO might say, I really need the executive director to understand this variance and address it. The executive director might say, this growth since last year, we need to emphasize this to our board. A board member might say, I see we have about a million dollars in cash. Is that enough or is that too much? And a development director might say, we need to trumpet these statistics to our funders. So graphics tell stories. This isn't art for art's sake, and we're not creating images for entertainment. The goal is to deliver important information, and graphics help us to do that because they help people to receive and understand information, especially quantitative information and comparisons. Here's an example of a graphic that we created. This graphic was delivered to a client and was very well received because it served a specific purpose and told a specific important story, which is spelled out explicitly at the top of the graphic in what we call the headline. And in this case, the headline says, contingency planning advised to maintain cash. If you only read the headline, you already know the story the graphic itself is telling. And that's exactly the point. And one other item that I wanted to point out here, you're going to see a number of graphics today. And, and I always like to tell folks that the graphics that we're showing and the case studies that we're showing, these are actual graphics that we've created for YPTC clients. We haven't made up anything for the purposes of this presentation. Obviously we've changed the names, but I think actually showcasing real use cases really also helps to showcase the value of, of data visualization and its storytelling impact. So this means that graphics is a term that refers to many things. Here today, we're talking specifically about data visualizations, which are always about comparing something to something else. And those comparisons are always quantitative. They're always measurable. They always boil down to numbers. That's what makes them suitable for a chart, for being plotted onto some kind of grid or table. Any given financial story might raise an alarm, trumpet a success, or recommend a particular strategy or action. If there's quantitative evidence for 
or a quantitative rationale behind any of those things, then a visualization may help to express it or emphasize it, just like the taller ladder is doing in the image on the slide. So let's get on the same page then by reviewing some core concepts. And these are concepts that apply not only to graphics, but to communication in general. And indeed, you'll see that the graphics we talk about today include substantial amounts of text. So the first core concept is the idea that your deliverables should invite the reader in, make them want to engage in the content and see what the deliverable has to offer. Think about something like a traditionally formatted financial statement. Would you describe it as foreboding or inviting? The thing is, every deliverable, every document, every kind of packaging is either inviting or it's not. This is also a fundamental design question for architects. A good design for a prison is one that makes people feel uninvited. It's threatening. It's terrifying. It's heavily fortified like what you see here on the left. This is Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia, a US National Historic Landmark. The entryway to the house on the right is the opposite. It's inviting, it's fun, it's reassuring, it's welcoming. You wanna package all of your deliverables in such a way that they invite the reader in. They say, hey, there's great information here and we want you to come in and see it. Here's another comparison. From your perspective, are the key points and takeaways in typical financial statements easy to access? When a board member first glances at a conventional financial statement, is it obvious where they should direct their attention if they have only a few seconds to read it? Does the conventional presentation tune out the noise and, and turn up the story on the essentials? There's certainly lots of important information to convey but you need to package that information in such a way that your audience can focus quickly on what matters most. Here's a way to visually sum up what I've been saying so far. Pretend for a moment that this is a standard financial statement. There's an important story here, but you can't see it with all of the other information presented on the page. It's only when we tune out the noise that the story becomes clear. And this is the goal of every visualization. The value is in the information and also in being able to quickly understand what is most important. Here's one last comparison. Imagine a board member who has very little financial management experience looking at a traditional statement of cash flows. Would they say, I love this way of presenting the information? Reading the statement of cash flows is like riding an escalator. I hop on and the next thing I know, I'm at the top. Or would they say, I know there's really important information here, but it takes me a while to work through it. You want to interpret explicitly. You have lots of great information to share and you need to do everything you can to help your readers through it. So let's move on to our next learning objective, distinguishing between static and dynamic graphic types and when to use each. So there are two main types of graphics you can use, static or dynamic. Static visualizations like the examples you see here are great for embedding into a PDF or being printed into hard copy because they can tell a specific story and they minimize reader effort, right? They're printed on a page or they're shown as a graphic on your screen. There's nothing really that the reader has to do with, uh, do with that graphic to interact with it. All of the information is, is right there. And that's what we mean, right? What you see is what you get. But if the point is to tell a timely specific story, that's a very good thing because it avoids distraction. And also those graphics can be sized for delivery, right? In the example that you see on the left-hand side of the screen, you see, a, you see a graphic in the upper right-hand corner. So that graphic has been sized to fit into that particular space. But say, for example, it's going to be presented in a different format. There may be more or less space available for that graphic. So certainly the graphic can be sized accordingly. Dynamic visualizations, like what you see on the right, 
on the other hand, are more open to interpretation, right? They're, you're interacting with them, right? You're, 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 you're clicking on things. There's things such as drill downs and filters and links. And in fact, dynamic visualizations actually reward that interact, interactivity, right? Because when you click on something, a new screen might open or you might be presented with new data to take a look at. And instead of being sized for a specific type of delivery, they're actually designed to be somewhat adaptable to various viewing conditions because different individuals may interact with that dynamic visualization or that dashboard in a different way. Some may use their computer, some may use, uh, use their phones. And, and you see links to uh, the dynamic dashboard examples on this slide here. One will take you um, to YPTC's homepage. So if you go to www.yptc.com forward slash data dash visualization, um, you'll be able to see a bunch of sample static visualizations, but also a number uh, of interactive sample uh, dynamic dashboards as well. And the second link that you see there to eastenddistrict.com, that's actually um, the, the graphic that we're showcasing uh, on the right-hand side uh, of, the, of the slide here. This was for a client in, in Houston where we built both a key performance indicators report and also a leverage report to show impact um, as well. So you're certainly welcome uh, to, to go to, to either or both of those sites and, and take a look at, uh, at the information that's there and, and certainly interact with the sample dashboards as well. Oops. Here's just a couple more examples, and I wanted to point out that the static graphic that's on the left-hand side, uh, you're going to see that coming up as one of our case studies uh, shortly, so, so stay tuned for more information uh, and the story behind that one. And then on the right-hand side, uh, just another example of dynamic graphics. Uh, this emphasizes a point that I made earlier where I said that the, 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 the dashboard or the dynamic graph uh, graphic might be sized for different viewing scenarios. So in this case, uh, you see three different sized screens, uh, what's meant to be uh, a computer or a laptop screen, uh, a tablet screen, uh, maybe using an iPad, uh, and then finally a phone, the smallest screen and, and showing all the different uh, scenarios that, that, that might be used for, for viewing that particular graphic. So here's a slide to sum up the differences between these two overlapping kinds of data visualizations. Again, the links are there at the bottom for all of the examples. Um, but I wanted to point out again, just to sum things up, if we're talking about a static graphic, it's telling a, a more specific story, minimizing reader effort, what you see is what you get, and of course, sized for delivery. Whereas for dynamic, more open for interpretation, rewards interactivity, contains various ways to interact with that data through the use of drill downs, filters, and links, and of course, built to adapt, built to adapt to various viewing conditions. So this is a great slide. Of course, you'll have all of these slides um, after today's presentation, but this is a great one to, to hang on to just for a quick side-by-side -side comparison uh, between the two graphic types, and of course, the links as well, so you don't have to worry uh, about writing everything down. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to turn uh, things over now to Edwin, uh, and he'll uh, he'll take us through the the next portion of the presentation. So Edwin, floor is yours. Terrific, thank you, Bill. So we've got um, some really good core concepts, and I want to uh, before we turn into case studies, we have four of them to go through. I want to talk through a little more specifically some of our um, key components or essential elements of static visualizations. So um, the uh, each of our uh, static graphics, uh, and we, if we can go ahead to the next slide, um, for building static graphics, we uh, in our data visualization group at YPTC. Um, we actually have an explicit standard for the design of these kinds of graphics. We train all of our YPTC accounting professionals to uphold that standard. And we actually have a name for it. We call it the JD standard in reference to the name of a particular designer whose work we admire. It includes five required elements, uh, and those are the ones that are labeled here. There are also two additional optional elements, and I'll get to those momentarily. 
Number one here, and you've already heard Bill mention this, is the headline. The headline should be brief, punchy, direct, just like a newspaper headline. It prepares the reader's focus for the rest of the graphic. Next is uh, number two, and that's the interpretation. This explains and elaborates the headline. So if you go no further than the interpretation in reading through one of these graphics, you really should already know what the graph below is illustrating. And maybe you can even imagine from the interpretation what the graph might look like. Number three then is the graph itself or what you might conventionally refer to as the chart. And this is the actual visualization of quantitative data. Numbers four and number five are the credit and the source. These elements are much less prominent visually. They're small text, they're down there in the bottom, they're, they're in a gray font, but they're nonetheless essential required elements in our standard. And that's because we want our reader to know where the data comes from that supports the graphic and the headline and who built the graphic, because that helps to build trust in the reader. And we can go to the next slide, please. At, um, the two optional elements uh, that I mentioned, um, I do wanna take a minute to talk about these. There are number six down here at the bottom and that is the notes. And then there is number seven, which is a legend. And you see an example up at the top on the right. We do not include these optional elements unless we're sure that we need them. In contrast, those five elements discussed on the previous slide, we include absolutely every time no exceptions on a static storytelling graphic. So let me take a moment to talk about these optional elements in more detail. Legends, that item number seven, these are conventional in charts and many chart building tools like Excel or PowerPoint will add a legend automatically. At YPTC, our approach is to avoid legends whenever we can and to use labels instead. But do use a legend if you would need to, say, repeat the labels many times in your graphic. That's why there's a legend being used in the example over here on the right. We don't want to label every single uh, column in this column chart because the labels are going to be the same. That's repetitive. So we're going to go ahead and use a legend. Or say in a line chart, if your lines are all too close together and there's simply no room for the labels, then a legend is warranted there as well. So labels and legends are always a judgment call, but as a general rule, we use legends only when we can't get by with labels because we like to make it as easy as possible for our reader to directly understand what each element of the chart represents. So the final optional element um, in our standard is number six, the note. And notes are not always needed, but they can be very helpful when there's something you need to say or a question you want to answer preemptively because you think your audience is likely to ask it. But you wanna do so without distracting from the more important text in the headline and the interpretation. So in this example, we're seeing on the screen, there's a headline about needing more unrestricted revenue. And we'll talk more about this in one of the case studies. But um, the, the, the big message is there in a the headline. But then we also wanted an acknowledgement down in the notes that the accounting department is also collaborating with program directors to optimize our allocation of overhead costs to programs. So while we're waiting for more unrestricted funds to come in, we are doing everything we can in the meantime. Okay. So let's go ahead and uh, dive into some case studies now that we've laid our foundation. Uh, and this is not only section number four, but there are four case studies we're going to go through. So our first case study is structured as a before and after. The group of charts you see here comprising what you may think of as a dashboard. This was our starting point. This was the before. We were asked to make this information more helpful to the readers, to their intended audience. The client in this case was an arts and culture organization, and their specific audience or the readers for these graphics was the finance committee on the board of directors. The unifying subject of these charts, of this dashboard, was year-to-date profit and loss. 
right? Year to date statement of activities. On the left, there are uh, pie charts showing actual revenues to date and also budgeted revenues to date. And over on the right, we have a column chart for the expenses where one column shows a stack of all the budgeted expenses to date and the other column shows a, a stack of all the actual expenses to date. Now we see charts like these all the time and we acknowledge these are accurate, they're organized, they include a lot of useful information, but do they reflect our core concepts for helpful graphics? Do they focus our attention where it's needed most? Do they make direct comparisons in ways that are easy to understand? And do they interpret those comparisons explicitly? Do they tell a story? Well, if the reader digs a little bit, they can find some financial stories to tell within these numbers. But the audience for these charts, the finance committee members, don't want to dig. Um, that's not how they should be spending their time. So in this case, there was lots of room for improvement. And we really do take seriously the matter of envisioning the reader for any given graphic that we build, of asking whom and in what context are these graphics supposed to help? Because if a graphic doesn't have a clear purpose and a defined audience, then no amount of clever, beautiful design can make it worthwhile. It simply won't work. In this case, the information was important, but it needed to be presented in a more helpful way. So here is the after. Here's the new version. We've gone from three charts, a complex dashboard, to one single chart that's all about comparisons and storytelling. If a finance committee member arrives a few minutes late to their meeting and has only 30 seconds or so to read this chart and get up to speed in the discussion, we want them to know exactly where to look, where to focus their attention, where to spend that 30 seconds. The title of the chart gets straight to the point, saying that gala cancellations are impacting our bottom line. That's our headline. And then there's an interpretive subtext, what we call the interpretation, that elaborates that headline, saying that pandemic-related cancellations held gala revenue far below our goal amount. Specifically, gala revenue was $116,000 compared to a budget of $500,000. That difference is reflected in our $300,000 year-to-date income, which is $230,000 below target as of March 31st. The over budget revenue from contributions reflects our efforts to convert some of the gala absentees to direct donors. Now, I said that um, this chart is all about making comparisons. It's a bar chart, and each row of the chart compares a year to date budget number directly with the year to date actual number. The dark bars represent, the bold bars represent year to date actuals. And those are sitting on top of gray bars that represent the year-to-date budget numbers. The boldest color represents, and the, and the boldest kind of most saturated things on here represent the most important numbers, with, which are the actuals. And the gray represents the budget, the comparison, the benchmark. We also added a row down at the bottom for total net income, which is total revenue minus total expenses. And this is so that our board member doesn't have to add up all the bars and do math in their head to know the organization's bottom line. And in fact, you might notice that we withheld any expense line items from this graphic at all because they weren't an important part of the story that our client needed to tell at this particular time. So the story for this finance committee meeting was really all about the unexpected changes in revenue and their impact on the bottom line. And this graphic was designed to focus their attention on that story. Remember how colorful the original set of charts were? There were blues, oranges, greens, yellows, purples across those pie charts and column charts. Some people prefer to see lots of loud colors all the time. That puts them in their emotional comfort zone. And we really respect that, but we also need to balance that against the need for this graphic to be easy to understand and to tell a very focused story. So in this graphic, and in most of the graphics we build, we actually started with black and white, with grayscale, and then we used color only very deliberately in a few places to link our interpretive text with the particular parts of the chart. 
Specifically, the orange color highlights gala revenue here, and the blue color calls out the total net income. We also see the credit and the source at the bottom of this graphic. A finance committee member who arrives a couple of minutes late to the meeting doesn't need to see this information in the first 30 seconds, so it should not compete visually with the rest of the graphic. The sources of the information in this case were the client's accounting system, MIP, and their board approved budget, which lived outside of MIP in an Excel file. So as we've previously discussed, these are the basic essential elements of effective static graphics. A headline that gets straight to the point, an interpretation that fleshes out the story, the graph itself, and then the source of the data and the person or team that built that graphic to help the reader feel confident in knowing where this information came from, who synthesized it and represented it. And the client does intend to update this graphic each month now as the year goes on. But as the story changes from month to month, so will the headline change, so will the interpretation will change, and likewise the use of color. Uh, maybe, for example, next month we're going to be focusing on expenses rather than revenue because that's where the story most needs to be told. But the overall structure, this bar chart with the, with the one line on top of the other, they're going to remain the same now that the finance committee is familiar with it. Let's stick with that theme of recurring static graphics that are updated periodically here in our second case study. Maybe they're updated once a month, maybe they're updated on a quarterly basis. So um, this case study comes from a client that provides social services to their local community. When someone sees a helpful graphic, one that's easy to understand, tells an important story, and interprets itself explicitly, they often want to see that graphic again in the future, but with updated data. And that's great, but it's always important to pause and consider what changes may be needed to keep the chart relevant to keep it useful going forward, and maybe how the chart should evolve from an original graphic that told a one-time specific story into an ongoing graphic, the story of which might change only slightly in future months. So in this graphic, the story being told was that an organization's service fees are increasing, complementing grants as steady revenue. This was an organization relying primarily on grant funding, but noticing that their service fees had been increasing, that that was becoming a really useful source of revenue. Now, here in the graphic, what we're showing in the background in gray is that grant revenue. That's our kind of benchmark. That's our background comparison point. In front of that, in direct comparison, in a bolder blue color, are those program fees, the monthly amounts of their program fees or their service fees. So after the client's leadership saw this graphic and appreciated its message, they agreed that service fees were a really good thing and they resolved to continue growing them. And then quite naturally, they wanted updates to this chart in order to track the growth of their service fees over time. So here's where we ended up. Over here on the right is uh, the new ongoing chart that serves that um, ongoing incremental change purpose. And let's talk a bit about how these two charts are different and why they're different. In contrast to the original chart, the new one focuses exclusively on service fees. So in the original chart on the left, we had grant revenue as a gray area in the background. But in the new one on the right, the light blue bars in the background show each month's actual service fees. And then what we're comparing to those monthly service fee numbers is a 12 month rolling average of those service fees. So for each month, the line shows the average monthly amount over the previous 12 months. Uh, you guys may be familiar uh, with this ever since the pandemic, the idea of a rolling average um, uh, has become much more common in our, in our sort of newspapers and, and media. So in the background, the actual numbers for each month spike up and down quite a bit, but that rolling average is a much steadier line and showing a kind of general trend. And it shows that the amount of service fees has indeed been going up and has continued to go up since the original chart was created. So the story for this new version of the chart was that service fees are now averaging over $50,000 per month, consistently supplementing contributions. 
and we have an interpretation that goes on to help the reader understand these metrics. Our income from service fees has been increasing since 2019 and now provides a reliable supplement to our income from contributions. We have earned as much as $71,000 in service fees in a single month. And our monthly average for the last 12 months is 52,000. Our goal for this 12 month rolling average is 60,000 by the end of 2022. So this is a story and a graph that's helpful to update each month going forward, as it will show the actual highs and lows in each month, as well as the ongoing rolling average over the last 12 months at any given point in time. And the organization is uh, very smartly making a target, setting a goal, right, a, a, a smart quote unquote goal for themselves um, of $60,000. And we wanna build that right into the chart so we know is this line heading towards that line as we want um, or is it heading in the wrong direction? All of the key elements of a static storytelling graphic are still here in the new ongoing version of the chart, a headline, an interpretation, the graph itself, the source of the data, the credit line. But the overall design has evolved in order to remain useful beyond the purpose of that original graphic. A few moments ago in the before and after case study, that case study number one, I showed a collection of uh, pie charts and a column chart, right? A dashboard that together presented profit and loss information or um, uh, activity information. And I then showed how we combined that information into a single chart to make those comparisons easier to read and more focused on a particular story. Well, in this case, uh, our third case study for today, we went in the opposite direction. First considering using a single chart to tell a story, but ultimately ending up with a pair of closely related charts. The story was a familiar one among growing nonprofits. Our client, a membership association, was earning more and more revenue each year, and that's great. But an increasing percentage of that revenue was donor restricted to specific programs. And so the client was having a hard time covering the overhead costs that were a necessary part of their growth. So in its final form here, the story we had to tell flows across two charts. Total revenue is trending up, but unrestricted revenue is not keeping pace. That's a single complex thought that's written out as a single complex sentence, but the two parts of that sentence each have their own graphic and their own interpretive subtext. The first chart explains that the success of our programs has been rewarded with increasing support from funders. As shown below, our total revenue has increased from 1.5 million in 2016 to nearly 2 million in 2021. We are currently projected to earn 2.11 million in 2022. So the first chart is really celebrating um, that increase in overall revenue. The second chart then adds that as expected, our overhead costs are increasing in step with program growth. Yet our revenue is increasingly restricted only to programs. In 2016, 49% of our revenue was unrestricted. By 2021, that number had fallen to 15%. We are projected to be even lower in 2022. And then we use italics for emphasis here. In order to continue covering the essential overhead functions that enable our programs, we must raise more unrestricted funds. As I said, this is a familiar story among profits. More revenue is great, but if too much of it is restricted, then the organization may find it increasingly difficult to cover their overhead. Now, I said this could maybe have just been one single chart, and that was kind of where we started in our minds, right? Maybe one that shows percentages within each column of the total revenue chart, but that wouldn't have told either part of the story well. Trying to show the percentage as stacks within the total revenue column could have overloaded the reader with information. And in any case, it's hard to compare percentages across years when the bars are changing size each year. So we ended up with what you see here, breaking down these two interrelated stories into separate but connected ch uh, uh, charts or graphics, each of which is tightly focused on a particular side of the story.
With static graphics, it's always the story that matters most. And so we design everything around the story. And if that means using more than one chart, then so be it. And I want to come back here just to the point I made earlier regarding that optional element of our standard, number six, the notes. Um, there is a note down here in the, in the chart on the right that says um, the accounting team, as I read before, is also collaborating with program directors to optimize our allocation of overhead costs to programs. That's a, that's a kind of we're doing the best until our recommendation to raise more unrestricted funds is able to be implemented. We didn't want it to compete with the headline or the interpretation. We didn't want to distract but it is um, a preemptive response to a question that we're likely to receive. Are you doing everything you can in the short term to help us through this? So uh, notes can be very helpful. They're not obtrusive. They don't compete visually with the main headline or the primary interpretation, even the chart itself, but they nonetheless let you say what needs to be said and shows your audience that you've done your due diligence. Okay. So let's turn to our fourth and final case study for today. People often say that cash is king. And so it's no surprise that cash is a common subject for graphics in the world of financial management. At YPTC, we've created all sorts of cash-related charts to tell a wide range of different stories. In this case, we had the head of a private school ask their YPTC accounting team to help set a target for the school's balance of unrestricted cash to make sure that they didn't dip into restricted cash to pay operating expenses. Then the accounting team projected the school's cash balances through the end of the fiscal year and asked us for a visualization to help the head of school present the results of their forecast to the board of directors. And this graphic here is where we ended up. It shows the results of the comparison and leaves no doubt about how to interpret those results. New revenue required to prevent dip into donor restricted funds. That's our headline, the key takeaway. And then the interpretive text below went on to say that our FY 2022 cash forecast revealed that new revenue sources are needed to remain above our target minimum of $450,000 in unrestricted cash. We are currently forecasted to be underwater from May to October, during which time we may be unable to cover the cost of operations in the event of unexpected expenses or reduced revenues. Now, having read all that, maybe you're thinking, well, there's no need for the graph itself because the reader already knows exactly what the graph will show. They already know the story that, that the numbers are telling. But as I'll say again in a moment, when we talk about packaging graphics for delivery, repetition is not always redundant. In fact, it can be very helpful to say something one way and then show it another way, especially if what's being said is something a CFO desperately needs their executive director to hear or that head of school, in this case, is desperate to get their board members to understand. As you can see, we had some fun in this graphic with the idea of being underwater with the, um, with the blue color and the kind of landscape, um, uh, vague reference to landscape in the, in the shape of the graph. But we didn't overdo it. We, we maintained the integrity of the quantitative evidence for the story that the head of the school needed to tell. Likewise, the story might have been missed if the only thing we showed here was where cash balances would be at year end, instead of also showing those mid-year months, which in with this case was the moment of high risk. Okay, so before we wrap up, I, I want to focus um, on our last learning objective and take a few moments to discuss how to package your graphics effectively for delivery. Let's say you've thought hard about your audience and the story you need them to hear. And then you applied our core concepts and those five essential elements of our JD standard to build a great graphic to tell that story. The next question is, how do you tailor that graphic to a specific mode of delivery. Maybe you originally designed your graphic for a PowerPoint slide presentation, but were then asked 
to paste it into a page-sized Microsoft Word document or PDF. Maybe you've been asked for a way to embed your graphic into a web page or a mobile app to help tell your organization's story to a much larger audience. But that graphic now needs to be a very specific size and shape in its new context. All of the above are doable with the right tools. And in most cases, the alterations you would need to make your graphic are only superficial. So if you're telling your story within an eight and a half by 11 inch printable text document, does your graphic need to be appended as an attachment down at the very end, or is it okay for it to go up at the top of page one? Well, certainly it can go at the top of the first page in line with what other text is there. The question really is, how important is the story your graphic tells compared to the other ideas being communicated in that document? And also what other content in the document is your graphic related to? Because the answers to those questions will tell you where in your document your graphic should go, and to some degree what size the graphic needs to be. What I'm showing you here is a mock-up of the kinds of financial summaries or memos that YPTC typically presents to its clients each month. There's not always a major new story to tell every month, but when there is, if a graphic helps tell that story, then we drop it right into something like the highlights section of our document. And notice that all of the key elements of an effective static graphic are still included here, even if they're repetitive with other things included in that document. We still have our headline, our interpretation, our data source, our credit line, and of course the graph itself. Some of this may repeat what's elsewhere in the document, and that's fine. As I said before, repetition is not always redundant. If there's an important story to tell, by all means, tell it more than once. Also, in our experience, successful graphics, those that get their point across effectively, they often end up getting pulled from their original packaging and dropped into other documents. Good graphics have legs. When people understand something, they tend to want to share it. So kind of be ready for someone to just take a screenshot and pull out your graphic and drop it in another context. So for those reasons, among others, it's good to always keep those five essential elements intact. One other thing to say about eight and a half by 11 inch documents. Remember back at the beginning of today's session when Bill mentioned that our superhero graphic was in black and white kind of faded into the background. Um, of one of those slides. Some people may print your eight and a half by 11 inch documents. And if so, they may print them in black and white or in grayscale. Please do yourself a favor and preview your graphic in grayscale to confirm that it holds up to that. Otherwise your hard work could be for naught if the most important person in your audience decides to print the graphic instead of reading it on their screen. In this case, as you can see, the graphic holds up pretty well to being reduced to black and white. But if it didn't, we would want to adjust it in some way. Now, if you're putting the graphic into a slide deck, um, default to making it big and bold and being the only thing on that particular slide. As I've said many times already, people have limited attention spans and multitasking is a myth. So it's best to focus your audience's attention as much as you can within the formatting constraints and requirements that you're presented with. And that includes being open to things like uh, creating dark mode or night mode or stealth mode versions of your graphics. The novelty of this look is exciting, uh, but I don't recommend it as a default. The easiest thing for people to recognize um, visually is a, a dark content against a light background. So uh, stick with that if you can. But when you are asked to make a graphic for uh, a slide that has a dark background or on a web page that has a dark background or within some other kind of dark background theme, know that there are ways to convert your graphic and make it work. So here's a comparison table for future reference before we wrap up. Um, and we are going to um, uh, make copies of these slides available. So we're kind of thinking of this one as a, as a takeaway for you to refer to later on. This probably all seems obvious when you're thinking about it, but I know for myself, it's easy to forget when I'm actually in the 
in the moment of building a graphic or building a memo or a document on a tight deadline. It all boils down, this page all boils down to one question. Where do you want your audience to direct their attention? That's it, it's really that simple. And some, here are some simple ways that you can do that. Every mark on your page either helps or hurts. If you wanna draw more attention, you use color, you make your marks bigger, more saturated, more kind of saturated with color or boldness. You can use bold font, you can italicize font, you can put things in all caps. If you're not very deliberately trying to draw your reader's attention something, then do the opposites. Um, uh, use grayscale, make your font smaller, smaller, less saturated, standard fonts, lowercase. Um, all of these things should never be just kind of done by default, but rather should be done with the intent of communicating the most important ideas, those key takeaways to your reader within your graphics. Okay, so with all of that, I know it's a lot of information. Uh, I'm gonna turn it back over to Bill and uh, take a look and see if, uh, if there's anything in the questions uh, or in the chat to address. All right, thank you, Edwin. I always love hearing all those uh, all those case studies because they're they're all such great stories. So uh, this does uh, bring us uh, just about to the end. So of course, uh, thank you everyone for for being here and and for participating. Um, I know Edwin's checking the Q and A right now. So so certainly, if if there's questions you have, uh, feel free to uh, to post those questions uh, in the Q and A, and and we'll be able to answer them. Looks like we will have uh, a couple moments here uh, to to wrap up, but. Uh, before we do that uh, again, and and like Edwin mentioned on the on the slide prior to this, that was a was a really nice kind of takeaway and reference slide. I think this one is uh, as well as we recap how you can be uh, a data visualization hero. So so you can do that by presenting numbers as graphics to help tell the story. Envision your audience to guide your design, right? We, we said always keep that, that, that end user in mind, who your audience is, who you're creating the, the graph for. Know the strength of static versus dynamic graphics. Each one has strengths uh, and is, is applicable and useful in, in different sets of circumstances and, uh, and scenarios. Uh, and for static graphics, uh, remember uh, to always include uh, the five essential elements uh, that, that we discussed, right? That headline, that interpretation, the graph, the credit, and the source, and of course, the, the two optional uh, elements that, that Edwin mentioned as well, uh, the legend and, and the notes, if those are needed, if those are warranted. But certainly those five essential elements uh, should, be, should be present every time on, on every single static graphic. And we certainly hope that you have a, a better idea of, of when and how to use visualizations after spending this time uh, with us today. Uh, again, uh, we hope that the case studies were helpful uh, and provided relevant examples of how you can tell a compelling story uh, about either your organization or the clients that you serve. Um, you'll see a slide shortly. Uh, when we move to the Q&A or when we get to the, the very last slide that will contain all of the different ways that you can uh, connect with, uh, with YPTC uh, if you would like your help or guidance uh, in telling your story. And again, just a reminder, um, we'll get the, the slides out to you today uh, following the presentation uh, through a separate email. Um, so again, we'd love to, to answer any questions that, uh, that we have. Edwin, are there any that have, uh, have come in or are we good? Uh -uh. I, I don't see I don't see any new ones. Um, there's a, a question we answered in in print regarding sort of what what tools do we use, uh, what applications or software do we often use for um, for both static and dynamic visualizations, and and we uh, included some of those there. But just to add, and this will kind of will I think make sense now that we've uh, been through the full presentation that that really our thought is whatever tool helps best tell our story, and if that means we're learning a new tool on the fly that week, that's what we'll do. Um, and that's, that's, you know, part of the fun of the kind of work we get to do, but it, but it really does all stem from that. It's what tools are available um, and kind of always being on the lookout for, for what's new, what's coming, what's being built to help your readers receive the information um, that you have to share. Great. Thank you. 
Um, so again, here on the screen, if you have a question, if you if you think of a question uh, later on, or you're watching a, a recorded version of this webinar once it's uh, once it's posted, um, if if you have a question, feel free to reach out to us using any of the methods you see listed on the screen here. Um, certainly, email is the fastest. That hello at yptc.com uh, that will uh, connect you uh, through uh, through to us. Uh, our our our, uh, our 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 sales team will will make sure that you are, are connected directly. Uh, directly with us. So uh, again, on behalf of myself, um, of Edwin, and the entire YPTC team, thank you for being here today. We appreciate uh, your time, uh, attention, and participation. Um, have a wonderful day, and I'll, I'll turn things back over to Claire if there's uh, anything uh, for her to mention for, uh, for the closing. Just to say thank you to our presenters for a really great webinar. And as mentioned, I will be sending out the recording and these slides shortly. So just keep an eye out for that. And we hope to see you at a future MNN webinar. Have a great rest of your day, everyone.